I'll introduce the first speaker is Dr. Mary Ellen Taplin, it's here on my right, um, who has been at the Dana-Farber now for as many years as I think I've been in, in Boston as well. And she is a senior uh, clinician and investigator uh, in genitourinary oncology, medical oncologist. Uh, amazing uh, in terms of the amount of work that she's done. Many of you who have been operated on um, in Boston may have been on one of the clinical programs that she put together where there are some uh, agents, drugs that are given prior to surgery and then surgery is done. Uh, and I think we've learned a lot as a result of uh, Dr. Taplin's you know, pursuit of science and trying to better understand you know, how to eradicate you know, prostate cancer that's more aggressive. On a personal note, um, you know, uh, Dr. Taplin, um, you know, has uh, a family. I mean, we see her as the doctor, but I kind of see her as the person. And tonight, right after this, uh, she'll be stepping out uh, for a concert that's been planned. And I really admire the personal and professional life balance that she tries to attain and we all try to attain in our various lives. It's so important. You know, she's here tonight to educate you. She'll take your questions and then she's got to go off to a concert. So. Um, I, I applaud her and respect her for keeping that balance. It's so important. And along those lines, at some point tonight, my wife will probably walk through the door back there, uh, maybe somewhere around 7, 7.15, and I'll introduce her as well. That certainly is the balance um, in my life. So as each speaker comes up, I'll, I'll introduce them. I'll have Dr. Taplin come up now and address uh, with you sort of the details in prostate cancer when it's more advanced or, or metastatic. So Mary Ellen. Thank you, Anthony. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I appreciate Anthony changing the, um, Dr. D'Amico changing the schedule around so that I could go first and take your questions uh, right after um, my presentation. So um, don't be shy about writing down any questions that you have that are on your mind because I can't cover everything um, during the presentation. I can't see anything because the lights are really bright. So also, I'm also good about if you have a question, raising your hand. I'm happy to um, just take questions from the audience if that, if that works. So um, Dr. D'Amico asked me to talk to you tonight about a more advanced stage of prostate cancer, uh, metastatic prostate cancer. And I'm going to try to limit uh, the medical jargon, the terminology that we use so that all of you can understand it in a way that um, we understand it, but maybe with a little less complicated terminology. So this is um, a figure of which represents prostate cancer and basically the continuum on the right from when prostate cancer starts in the prostate, we call that organ combined or in the prostate. And in some cases, when the cancer is not cured by either surgery or radiation, then it moves along a pathway, sometimes we call that the natural history of the cancer, from the PSA rising, uh, subsequently to being able to see the cancer on scans, we call that metastatic cancer, to the cancer becoming resistant to hormone therapy. And it's a term that most people, patients and doctors alike don't love, but we call that castration-resistant prostate cancer, when the ca cancer has become resistant to medications like Lupron and Zolodex. How does prostate cancer become resistant to drugs like Lupron and Zolodex? How does it become castration-resistant prostate cancer? We don't fully know the answer to that question. Um, scientists and clinician scientists have been working on that probably for 60 or 70 years. We have more knowledge about this process than we did, um, more knowledge every year, in fact. While we've been able to definitely extend life with newer therapies, we haven't been able to kick this problem of stopping prostate cancer on the right-hand part of the screen, where it's dependent on um, hormones and fairly well-behaved, to what's represented on the left part of the screen, those black dots, where despite the patient having a low blood level of testosterone from medicines like Lupron, the cancer cells are able to grow on their own. That's called castration resistant. So tonight I'm gonna to show you a little bit of how we treat both metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, the cancer on the right, and metastatic 
castration-resistant prostate cancer, which is represented uh, on the left. So this is a cartoon, a schema, of the treatments that are approved in these various states or stages of prostate cancer. On the right is the metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. These are patients who might be diagnosed with a new diagnosis, and they have metastasis. And on the whole other side of the slide, those are patients who have castration-resistant prostate cancer and have been treated with all the FDA-approved therapies that we have. So I'm going to walk you through some of this data in the subsequent slides. And for hormone-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer, in addition to drugs like Lupron, we use a chemotherapy drug called docetaxel and or a hormone pill called abiraterone. And then for the castration-resistant disease, these drugs that are shown moving to the left have all been approved for prostate cancer. Abiraterone, enzalutamide, Cipulus-LT, which you might know as Provenge, docetaxel, radium, which you might know as Zofigo, and so forth. Carbazitaxel is another type of chemotherapy. I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time talking about these drugs because they've been around now for four or five years, and we've talked about them in this forum in the past, um, because I always get asked a lot of questions at the end about newer treatments that are not yet FDA approved, so I thought I would spend some of my time on that, um, but I'm happy to take questions about these. So just as an introduction to hormone-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer, um, we're all reluctant to talk about dying from cancer, but I, can, I know from many years in the clinic that it's always on patients' mind, and I thought it would be instructive and somewhat positive to show you the data that says that while about 230,000 new cases of prostate cancer just in the U.S. every year, only about 10% of patients die from prostate cancer each year. It's, believe me, still too many. A lot of people I become very close to are in this category. But um, overall, most men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer, 90% of them, in fact, uh, are either cured from their disease or living very well, sometimes for several decades with their disease. But in terms of this situation called metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, that's about 10% or about 10,000 deaths per year. And there's been a lot of attention recently to this population of patients in trying to use the drugs that have in the past been saved to later stages of the disease, castration-resistant, and using them earlier. And the results have been positive. Just a quick review of hormone therapy in prostate cancer. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with it. But hormone therapy is a euphemism for what's called androgen deprivation therapy. We're not giving patients hormones. We're giving them medications that lower the blood level of testosterone to very low levels. And um, then, as I said, when a patient with metastatic prostate cancer has been on hormone therapy, for anywhere from 18 to 24 months. In general, we often see castration resistance setting in. And that usually occurs earlier with a higher burden of disease that is more metastasis, or in patients who don't receive an optimal response to hormone therapy uh, based on the PSA and other measures. So this is what's happened recently in the last two years. First, there was a trial, I'm gonna show you in the next slide, called the CHARTED trial which looked at using chemotherapy called docetaxel in the hormone-sensitive setting. And a subsequent trial, which was just uh, presented this year, so this is hot off the press data, looking at abiraterone, or Zytiga, um, in this group of patients. There's some notable differences from the chemo versus the abiraterone. I'm sorry, this slide, is, this computer is very sensitive. So this is the charted trial, and it's a schema which shows you that Patients were assigned to hormone therapy and chemotherapy or hormone therapy alone, and then they were evaluated with scans, a CAT scan and a bone scan, every 12 weeks and followed for progression, how well they did. The green line on the top is um, the patients. These are 
how long people lived on the study, and the green line is those that got the chemotherapy and the hormone therapy, and the blue line is the patients who just got the hormone therapy. And there was a significant improvement in how long people live simply by taking a drug that we've been using in prostate cancer since the late 90s and moving it up earlier when the cancer's still sensitive to hormone therapy. Dr. Sweeney is one of my colleagues at Dana-Farber. He was a lead author presenting this data in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. We're very proud of Dr. Sweeney for this work, which changed um, how we treat patients. One surprise in this study was that the chemotherapy did not benefit all patients, and we don't really understand why. But in this trial, they studied patients by the volume of their metastatic disease. And this um, graph on the right is the patients who had four or fewer metastases, and the one on the left are patients who had a higher burden of disease or more than four metastases. And the patients who had few metastases did not benefit at all from the chemotherapy, and the patients who had more metastases did um, by a you know, significant proportion. So because of this, we don't, we've kind of parsed out the chemotherapy in this stage of disease, and we don't recommend it for men who have limited metastatic disease, um, but for those who have four, more than four metastases, we do. It's life prolonging. Um, I wanted to show you this data because, um, you know, we think about PSA a lot when you're a patient with prostate cancer and, and the clinician, and PSA does predict for you know, how long someone's going to do on their primary hormone therapy. And um, the patients in the top in the black line are patients who get a PSA nadir, that's the lowest PSA of less than 0.2, and the other lines are, are higher. Um, and so you, a patient might be stable on their initial hormone therapy and or hormone therapy and chemotherapy for many years if they're in this group with a PSA of less than 2. Point to, whereas if their PSA nadir is much higher, then um, they could have a, limited, a more limited response to their hormone therapy. So we use PSA nadir as a prognostic uh, feature of um, the treatment. So I'm going to switch gears to this drug called abiraterone or Zytiga. It's a pill. comes in a bottle like this. Some of you may be familiar with it. And what this drug does is this, this is... Um, a representation of a cancer cell. This is the nucleus, and when um, the androgen receptors bind to the DNA, they cause the cell to grow. They turn on genes. And this drug, abiraterone, blocks the hormones um, that bind to the receptor that cause the cancer cells to grow, and it's very effective in prostate cancer. So this trial called the Latitude Trial studied abiraterone in the, you know, this hormone-sensitive state compared to just Lupron and a placebo. And similar to the chemotherapy, the top line, which is a yellow line, showed a benefit in a 38% reduction of dying from prostate cancer if you got this abiraterone drug at an early stage of the disease versus the latest stage. So again, this has been practice-changing therapy, and we now will prescribe either abiraterone or docetaxel earlier in the state of the disease, metastatic hormone sensitive, and not waiting for castration through distance. And now there are trials I'm not going to share with you tonight because of the limited time, but that are looking at moving these drugs even earlier, such as when the patients don't have metastasis, just a rising PSA, or even together with early therapies like surgery and radiation. These are the drugs, the types of treatments that have shown a benefit. OS means overall survival, which translates into people living longer um, if they get these trials. And these have all been studied in very rigorous prospective fashion. All these trials had more than 1,000 patients in them. And all led to these treatments being approved, FDA approved, and therefore standard for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. We have in, uh, intensive hormone therapies like abiraterone and enzalutamide. We have two t chemotherapies. We have uh, Cipulus-LT, which is a type of immune therapy, and then radium-223, which is uh, something that we think of as liquid radiation. But what about newer treatments? That's what everybody's interested in. Those have become a little bit old news. 
Um, and the sad state of affairs is that this is a list of phase three trials. So each of these trials on one of these lines had over 1,000 patients in it. Combining different new drugs with docetaxel, all of these trials were negative. So, you know, a disappointment in the field. Um, we're not um, stymied by this because the research goes on, but um, there has not been a new treatment approved for castration-resistant prostate cancer in about four years um, because of all of these negative trials. But a hopeful um, therapy is a whole new class of drug in prostate cancer, which are, have been used in ovarian cancer for a couple years called PARP inhibitors. And this drug, Olaparib, uh, which is made by AstraZeneca, the trade name is Linparza, um, is proving to be effective in some men with prostate cancer. And the reason it's effective is that this represents about um, a study we did. I think I've shared it with this audience in the past, but we did metastasis of 500 men with metastatic prostate cancer that was resistant to their hormone therapy sequenced the genes and found that a quarter of them had mutations in the genes uh, that include BRCA2 and BRCA1. You may have heard them. They, we have known those genes have been mutated in breast cancer and ovarian cancer for many years. But it turns out if you're a patient whose tumor or even the genes that you were born with called germline genes harbor these mutations, you'll respond to these drugs. And this is a trial that was done that these are the gene mutations which won't mean a lot to you. There's a lot of genes in this pathway. Um, but the shaded boxes, these are the patients on this side, which is um, your left side, which had a very positive response to this drug in advanced prostate cancer. So this will be um, our next new group of drugs in prostate cancer. And whether you have these mutations may also predict for a response to some of the immune therapy that you're seeing advertised on TV a lot. Um, and a few of these patients, these are a whole list of different types of patients, but you can see um, the prostate or the purplish bars is two or three of them in this line. They did respond to this checkpoint blockage. We're not commonly using checkpoint blockage in prostate cancer, but in about 5% of men, there will be predictors of response. And this is a trial looking at combining a type of immune therapy with a DNA repair a, a PARP inhibitor. And these lines below the graph represent seven of 17 patients with a BRCA2 mutation who responded. So we're excited about developing new treatments in this, in this area, biopsying tumors, sequencing them, and using a more targeted, personalized approach to um, applying these therapies. And I'll close with these last couple slides of showing this treatment, which is a radioactive uh, uh, compound, lutetium, that's labeled to PSMA, prostate-specific membrane antigen. This is a protein that's on the surface of prostate cancer cells. And then this compound can be used. It's called the theronostic. It's like a new word. At least it was a new word to me. This can be used to either do a scan, like a PET scan, so it's diagnostic, or we can tag different types of therapy to it, in this case, a radioactive compound, so that the antibody to PSMA delivers it to the tumor, and then the radiation uh, will kill it. It's kill the tumor. It's um, an improvement on radium. It's a similar idea to radium, but because it's more targeted, it will go right to the tumor. So, um, a trial has been done and reported, and this gives you a schema, schematic of the antibody taking um, the payload, if you will, in this case, the beta and gamma emitting radiation to this prostate cancer cell. And this was a trial that was published in a, a, a respectable journal called Lancet Oncology, looking at this treatment in prostate cancer patients. Um, this is the schema for the trial. Uh, it was done at a single site, patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. The treatment's given IV every six weeks. It's a short infusion like radium, over 10 minutes. These were the patients that went on the trial. Um, and I put this up here just to say that some of these patients had a lot of treatment 
80% of them had had chemotherapy, 80% of them had already had Zytiga. So this is a group of patients that don't always respond well to sub subsequent therapies, and you can see these are the PSA responses, um, and there, anything below this line is the PSA going down. And 70% um, of patients, 21 of 30 patients, um, had a 50% or more drop in their PSA. And some of them had quite more. So we're excited about this treatment in the field. We're going to have a trial at Dana-Farber looking at this therapy uh, probably the first quarter of next year, a couple months away. Um, and we'll have this op option for patients. So I'm going to close. I'm going to take questions. Melissa's here. If you have your questions, write them down. I'm going to repeat them and try to answer them. This is my GU clinical research team. We we uh, have, oh, I don't know, any, at any one time, 15 or more prostate cancer trials open. This year, we're going to have our biggest year of accrual, I think, ever, about 250 patients uh, uh, on trials. So I have about 25 people working for me. Uh, this is me right there in the middle, and this is some of my research coordinators and nurses. Um, and uh, I'll stop there and take questions. Thanks. Thank you, Mary Ellen. And Michelle is circulating around. If there's questions, please write them down on the, the card that you got on the way in, and then we'll bring them right here to the front, and we'll take a few. And while that's happening, um, I see that Dr. Kybel's in. He'll be up next. So Adam, as soon as we're finished with the questions, you can come on up. Um, I wanted to say that, you know, Dr. Taplin is, you know, extremely humble. It was almost you now 15, 20 years ago when she had a paper in the New England Journal that sort of was the forerunner of a lot of what she was talking about on this slide that has become sort of in the mainstream now, and that's you know, understanding the genetics of prostate cancer and using it, using the genetics you know, to try to come up with a treatment that's targeted. She talked about PSMA, targeted antibody therapy with a radi radioactive isotope uh, attached. This is some of the work that she was doing literally 20 years ago and has now come into the spotlight. So she won't say that, but I'll certainly say it. She really is, you know, a person who was very forward thinking even two decades ago. So Marilyn, I'll have you come to the microphone okay. so you can read the questions and that way um, the audience can hear. Okay, great. Um, all right, see now I'm up here. I don't get to study them uh, ahead of time. Um, all right, I'm gonna start with this one. Uh, Zytiga is really, so Zytiga is the trade name for a drug called abiraterone acetate, and I talked to you about that, um, is really doing the trick for me. My only complaint is my libido is as low as low can go. Um, I'm wondering if the 1,000 milligram dose is based on body weight or another index. It's a relatively new drug. Is it possible to be tweaked? I have metastatic cancer have had surgery, androgen deprivation therapy, and radiation, all went well. So that's a great question. Um, I, I have um, been working with Zytiga for over 10 years from before it was approved, so I'm very familiar with it. It can be tweaked, and I can tell you about how it can be tweaked, but the tweaking won't help the libido. Um, so the libido is low because the blood level of testosterone is low. And in general, you know, even just Lupron will do that. So, you know, altering the dose of uh, Zytiga a little bit is probably not going to have any effect on, Z on the Zytiga. How I sometimes tweak the Zytiga is um, sometimes I stop the Lupron when patients are on it because Zytiga is so much better than Lupron at lowering testosterone. Zytiga lowers testosterone in the testicles, which is what Lupron solely does but also in the adrenal glands and in the tumor cells themselves. Um, so, and some, some patients can get away with a, a lower dose of Zytiga, 750, three pills a day, or even 500, which is two pills a day. Um, and we know that because some patients don't tolerate it for one reason or another, either liver enzyme abnormalities or blood pressure, and then we ratchet it down and their cancer stays stable on a lower dose. So sometimes it is fine to take a lower dose, but not for the reason of getting better libido. And I'm going to leave it at that. Um, the next question is, please comment on the role of immunotherapy in treating prostate cancer. So it's been a struggle and a challenge um, finding a, uh, effective immunotherapy for prostate cancer. 
Um, we were really surprised about 12 years ago now when Cipulus-LT or Provenge was approved for prostate cancer because it literally was the first immunotherapy in what we call a solid tumor. A solid tumor is a tumor that started in an organ, like the breast or the colon or the prostate, versus a liquid tumor, which is like leukemia or lymphoma. Um, but most people feel that Provenge is really, despite that it was a positive trial, it was a small trial, it was done in a day and age where there was really not much effective for prostate cancer, that Provenge or Cipulus LT is probably not a very effective immune, immunotherapy, and it's even possible it wouldn't have gotten approved in this day and age had it been tested now. Um, like I said, the immunotherapy to date, about 5%, which is pretty low, of prostate cancer patients we think will respond to the immunotherapy drugs that are approved for melanoma and lung cancer and, and others, either the PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors. And usually we pick those patients by doing a biopsy and looking at something called MSH high, um, and it's 2 to 4% of prostate cancer patients that have that mar marker, and those are the ones that seem like they will get a response to immunotherapy. I have tried, you know, some people think, like, throw the kitchen sink in, even though they're expensive, even though there's potential for life-threatening toxicity, a patient's dying from prostate cancer, why not try it? Um, I'm not really in that camp, although some of my patients have asked me to get it for them, and most insurance companies will not approve it, and it's really expensive. I don't know how much, but my guess is like $20,000 a dose, and it's given every two or three weeks. Um, so, um, so that's the story, but I can tell you there's a huge push to figure out immunotherapy and prostate cancer. There's a long list of companies that are looking at vaccines and um, different other approaches to immunotherapy and prostate cancer. So I don't think anything will be approved or known to be effective in the next year, but I'm very optimistic that inside of five years, um, there will be more than one immunotherapy in prostate cancer. All right. Ooh. Keto diet and effects on prostate cancer. I'm not sure what that means. Do you mean the ketogenic diet? Yep. Okay. I'm not a big fan of, like, um, very structured diets, um, so I'm going to skip that because I don't know anything about it, and my bias would be, like, like Anthony says, balance about life work and home. I'm like all about balance, about diet. So I'm, I'm like, wouldn't be the one to give you the answer you want on that. <laughs> um, the next one, androgen deprivation therapy and docetaxel study. So that's a charted trial, I believe. Trials showed not all patients responded, but the reason is unknown. Is there a genetic correlation um, study happening? Yes, there is. Um, one of the genetic correlations that seem to respond to lack of response to almost anything in prostate cancer, hormone therapy, um, uh, chemo, docetaxel, maybe even surgery, is certain types of mutations, and particularly a mutation in a gene called p53, uh, or one in another gene called MYC or RB. Those tend to be aggressive tumors uh, that tend to um, be resistant to most of our usual therapies. So it's not standard of care to um, necessarily get these types of tumor gene sequencings, especially very early in the disease, um, but that's what some of the research has shown. And Mary Ellen, there's just a, there's two other questions that you probably didn't address in those answers. One is somebody with high volume metastatic disease on Lupron and Abiraterone. Uh, what's the next step when they stop responding to that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it's a little bit early days um, in terms of um, the question that's being asked is if someone's given abiraterone, which is an intense hormone blocker early, and then they become resistant to it, is that now castration-resistant prostate cancer going to respond well to what would have been our standard next therapy with a drug like enzalutamide or apalutamide, which is another hormone therapy. Um, I would say we don't really know because we just started giving these patients chemotherapy a couple years ago, so, um, but most of us would give enzalutamide or apalutamide as the next step 
in that treatment. But of course, every treatment decision has to be individualized. Another option could be radium. Another option could be Cipulus LT, Provenge, um, or a trial, looking for you know, something newer. And a final question here is about genetic studies. So uh, Dr. Sweeney has recommended that somebody may be a good uh, candidate for a gene study. And the question is, uh, what possible benefit would that have to the patient as well as their family members? Do you mean genetic counseling? Who wrote that question? Do you mean by a gene study, do you mean going to a genetic counselor and getting your germline measured? Yeah, that's what I mean. uh, my last appointment with Dr. Sweeney uh, two weeks ago, he said a, a woman helped me with um, paperwork oh, yeah. to sign up for a genetic Yeah, yeah, yeah. Study. Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. I would have planted him here. That, that's my study, um, and I'm very excited about it. <laughs> um, so what I didn't show you, because I didn't want to take the time from everyone else, is that, you know, so um, over the years and the decades, we never really recommended genetic counseling. What he's, this patient, is talk, this man is talking about is genetic counseling, screening for the blood. It's a blood test for a mutation that a patient, a woman or a man, could have been born with that makes them predisposed to getting cancer. So say you're talking about the gene BRCA2. Women with BRCA2 in the family, they could get it from their father, they could get it from their mother, but they have a very high risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And we never used to screen men with prostate cancer because back when it was looked at, probably the wrong prostate cancer patients were looked at because most men with prostate cancer with new diagnosis so a little bit of Gleason 6, and we now know we don't even have to treat most of those cancers. But when you look in patients with potentially, what I like to define it as potentially lethal prostate cancer, that's a localized high risk that's not cured with surgery or radiation, all the way to metastatic prostate cancer. If you look at those patients, 10 to 12% of them were actually born with genes like BRCA2. And I don't know what you think, but I think 10% is a lot. Because if you are in the 10% that have that, and you have children or brothers and sisters, there's a 50% chance that the children or the brothers and sisters could have it too. And those people need to be screened. They need you know, appropriate mammograms, appropriate colonoscopies, appropriate PSAs and rectal exams. So what this trial is that was recommended for you, we want we're going to study, um, with research dollars that I have, 500 men with potentially lethal prostate cancer. And we're going to draw the blood. It's free genetic screening. It's free genetic counseling. And we're going to compare the standard way to do genetic counseling is you meet with a counselor for an hour, get the whole spiel, get the blood drawn, versus we made a video. So you can see me on a video, um, eight-minute video. Uh, that you get all the information and then you decide if you want the blood test. And only the 10% that are positive will come back and talk to the counselors. And then we're looking at a lot of other important um, endpoints. Does it affect the prostate cancer patient's therapy? What about the family histories? What about the testing of the family members? Um, so I'm really excited about it. It's really popular. It's 500 patients. We signed up like 300 patients like inside of a year. Um, and so that's what it is. So, you know, go for it. Thank you very much. Yep. Let's give Dr. Kaplan a hand. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, next, we're going to introduce Dr. Adam Keibel, who's the chief of urology at the Brigham Women's Hospital. He's going to talk more about surgical considerations uh, in prostate cancer. I'm sure some of you may have gotten to meet him uh, in the office and maybe even in the operating room. You know, Adam is, has been, you know, with us you know, seven, five, seven, seven years, although he was here almost two decades ago um, and was actually trained by the person who will be speaking next. Uh, and we're so proud that, you know, we have Adam here now as our leader, you know, in urology and really taking the helm. You know, he uh, also has something that he needs to do tonight after this, and I, again, respect that balance. He's a father, and he has a son who's in high school uh, who has uh, an event tonight uh, that he'll be going to after this. So we'll be taking your questions, Adam, right, right after this. And I think I should mention, too, that, you know, it's really wonderful that we can have this recorded so you can hear it later. And it's really a, at the generosity and courtesy of, uh, of a gentleman who's named David Maris, who has a foundation that supports this uh, seminar and the recording every year. So we're very grateful to him. So Adam, we're looking forward to your comments. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's truly a privilege to be here. I apologize that I have to go, but the, uh, the school, uh, we scheduled this way in advance, but the school didn't consult me before deciding when academic night was going to be. And unfortunately, my wife is out of town, so it fell to me. So uh, this is a nice picture, I think, of the Pan Math Challenge. I don't think uh, Mary Ellen had a chance to encourage people to participate. Uh, looking out in the crowd, I see many people who I do know do participate in this. Uh, it's an important uh, fundraiser that allows uh, the Dana-Farber Brigham Women's Cancer Center to do a lot of the great work that we do uh, and I encourage people to participate in it and support uh, friends and family that do. Uh, so uh, my job in the next uh, 15 minutes, and I'll try and keep it short and sweet, is to go through some of the uh, changes or advances in surgery. I, I found myself giving exactly the same talk year after year, so I tried to mix it up a little bit and include some uh, video uh, that I thought at least might entertain the crowd about the benefits of uh, robotic surgery, and hopefully uh, Dr. Ritchie won't take me out back and club me to death uh, after the talk. These are the treatment alternatives for uh, prostate surgery. Uh, excuse me, for prostate cancer. If you have localized disease, I mean, Mary Ellen just gave a fantastic talk about systemic therapy. Uh, and importantly, uh, Dr. Taplin and I are, are tr uh, tr along with the radiation oncologists, in particular Paul Nguyen, are trying to integrate systemic and local therapy uh, because people that have aggressive prostate cancer, we feel very strongly benefit. Oh, great, excellent. Uh, benefit. Uh, uh, very much from uh, multimodality approaches. But I'm going to limit my discussion to people who can be managed with a, uh, with, with a single uh, intervention and also limit my discussion to radical prostatectomy, active surveillance, and focal therapy. So first of all, uh, active surveillance, I think this is a very attractive option for people. Uh, several decades ago, we would have treated everybody with aggressive surgery uh, we would, or, or radiation therapy. Uh, we would have patted ourselves on the back because we cured everybody. Uh, and in point of fact, many of those patients didn't need to be cured. Uh, they would have done fine uh, with no intervention. Uh, so the criteria for active surveillance is which when we follow low-risk prostate cancer very carefully, and I want to emphasize that, follow the cancer very carefully. Because occasionally I have patients who come in and they're on active surveillance and I haven't seen them for two years and I say, who's following your prostate cancer? And they say, why you are? And I'm like, no, I'm not, because you haven't seen me in two years. So you need to be followed very closely. But it's patients with low PSA, low grade, essentially picked up by PSA screening, less than, in my, in my practice, less than three cores positive, uh, each core less than 50% of a core. And the reason why we like that low volume disease is not because we worry more about Gleason 6 cancer that is higher volume, but because there's probably, almost certainly, in fact, some Gleason 4 or 5 cancer hidden in that high volume, low grade disease. Uh, and uh, one of the issues we always wrestle with is age. I actually believe that younger patients can be followed with active surveillance, but I impress upon them that they're paying with you know, less of a net because if the cancer progresses, they have many more years to lose, which is an issue. And also that they're probably going to be treated eventually. We're just delaying the treatment. We're allowing them to have a better quality of life for five or ten years. But the odds are, if you're 55 years old, that you will progress. Uh, we follow them with very closely with PSA and DRE, and there are frequent biopsies. MRI has been a huge boon for following patients with prostate cancer. And many groups that used to do annual biopsies now mix an MRI in so they don't have to do the biopsy every year. I never did the biopsy every year. I did the biopsy less frequently than that. I use MRIs, but unfortunately a negative MRI does not mean you don't have prostate cancer. Uh, about 85% of patients who have a negative MRI don't have aggressive prostate cancer. I, excuse me, I should, uh, uh, the, the, the way I phrase this is very important. If you have aggressive prostate cancer, if you don't have aggressive, I gotta say this right, if you have aggressive prostate cancer, 85% of the time it will be picked up by an MRI, but 15% of the time it won't. So that's one of the reasons why we continue to do biopsies. So this is the, the, probably the, the best study that's looked at this by a gentleman named Lori Klotz in Toronto, almost 1,000 patients. Importantly, a third of these patients ended up getting treated for eventually uh, some of the patients did develop metastatic disease. 
Not everybody managed this way won't develop um, uh, aggressive prostate cancer, and there were actually 15 deaths from prostate cancer. But still, that means 98% of the patients at 10 years hadn't died of prostate cancer, and 94% hadn't died at 15 years. Now importantly, he was doing this mostly in older patients, not in younger patients, and a lot of these patients died of other causes. I mean, at 15 years, roughly half the patients had died of another cause. And that's a little bit where this controversy about what to do about the younger patient comes in. Now, I think uh, importantly, we need to think about whether we can go ahead and do this in patients with Gleason Pattern 7. I see patients who come in who say, I just have a little bit of 7, I just have a little bit of 4, can't I be on active surveillance? And my gut is that that's not a good idea. And Dr. Klotz has actually presented data that, that would show that, in fact, it's not a good idea. Because he did enroll patients who had Gleason 7 cancer. There were patients that were a little older over the age of 70. And there were patients that had three plus four, so mostly three with a little bit of four. And even in this group, he found out these patients were the patients who developed metastatic disease and the patients who died of prostate cancer. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve. I think you probably saw some of these before. And what you can see at the top, these are the patients who truly had low-risk disease, Gleason 6 cancer. And you know, at, at 15 years, 98% of them hadn't died of, of disease. And if you look at the patients that had Gleason, the higher grade disease, you can see these uh, the intermediate risk. Now it's dropped down to, you know, 88%. So 12% of those patients actually died of cancer. And if you break it down even more, looking at the patients who had uh, uh, Gleason 6, low risk. These are the real, the patients I like to put on. Basically no one's died of prostate cancer. But if you look at patients who have maybe a slight Gleason 6 and a slightly high PSA, they do pretty well. But as you add the Gleason 7, you're finding that more and more of these patients die of prostate cancer, including the few patients that had 4 plus 3, and yeah, PSA of less than 20, but 4 plus 3. When you get out here 15 years, 63% of the patients had developed, hadn't developed metastatic disease, meaning roughly 40% of them had. And many of you in the audience are on hormone therapy, and you know that's no picnic. So we don't want patients to develop metastatic disease. So active surveillance, active surveillance is used in less aggressive cancers. Some patients do progress on treatment. It's not a free lunch, and there's some risk involved, therefore. And the, the risk is missing some aggressive cancers. So what about focal therapy? You can't, you know, focal therapy is the new hot thing. Uh, the idea of focal therapy is if you have a lesion, you can go ahead and either ablate part of the prostate, leaving some normal, or in this case, ablating half of the prostate, leaving at least the neurovascular bundle alone on one side, or you can just maybe just destroy the cancer. Uh, maybe you leave a little bit of the Gleason 6, that's this right here alone, and you just ablate the higher risk disease. And I, and I think this makes a lot of sense intuitively. Uh, I, I understand the attraction of it, and I think in the right patient, we're gonna turn to this more and more in the future. I think the problem is, is the proof isn't quite there yet, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna go through why I think that's the case. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be exploring it. It doesn't mean there aren't patients that would clearly benefit from it, but the problem is choosing the right patient. There's a lot of different energy that's used, cryotherapy, high food, this is high intensity focused ultrasound, just like you can focus light because it has a wave. You can also focus sound and deliver a lot of energy in a very small space. And lastly, laser ablation. Uh, patients get very excited, and me too, about you know, lasers and robots and things like that. But this is actually a laser that might actually uh, help. Uh, and so uh, one of the best studies I've seen recently was a, a focal therapy trial that combined the concept of active surveillance with some form of therapy. So the goal of this trial was to see if they could use a form of focal therapy to decrease the likelihood that a patient on active surveillance would progress and therefore need an intervention. So it's a randomized trial where they took about 200 patients. Uh, they gave them a, a, a photodynamic therapy. So it was a therapy that was uptake by the cancer cells, then you delivered the laser light percutaneously, and the cancer cells would die. Uh, they had an MRI to define the anatomy. Uh, they gave the, the poor, uh, I can't even pronounce this, but it's a, uh, it's a uh, photodynamic therapy, uh, and then activated with a laser light. And then uh, a, a, another 200 patients were just put on standard active surveillance, and they rebiopsied them all at two years. And what they were interested in, first of all, it was very well tolerated. I mean, obviously, if you're going to do focal therapy and it has a lot of side effects, it's probably, probably not any better than just a, a surgery or radiation. 
Uh, the disease progression was what they were actually looking at, which was mostly focused on pathology. You know, the important one I highlighted here is progression of Gleason 7. I'm not sure some of these other ones, such as a higher PSA, are that important. And then the real one we're all interested in, and hopefully this projects, is metastasis or death. And they found if you looked at just the disease progression, not the metastasis or death, they found that in the patients that were treated, it was 28%. Whereas in the patients on standard active surveillance, it was 58%. So there's two lessons there. First of all, a lot of patients progress on active surveillance. I actually think this 58%, I'm sorry, very sensitive, 58% is remarkably high. I haven't seen patients progress that rapidly on active surveillance, at least not in my hands. Uh, the 28% is more what I sort of standardly see. Uh, but it's a randomized trial, it's the patient population they had, and I think that's fairly, fairly important that patients put on active surveillance treated like this stay on active surveillance. I think the problem is, is that Gleason 7 is not the problem. Nobody cares whether you get Gleason 7 or not. What you care about is what's the implications of having Gleason 7. Gleason 7 is more likely to lead to metastasis or death. So at the end of the day, what we really want to see is that patients do well and they don't have a progression. And if that lesson from Lori Klotz showed anything, is if you follow these patients out long enough, you will identify patients who are going to do poorly. And I'm not sure that this actually will prevent that poor outcome from happening. By getting rid of the Gleason 7, it's possible that we've just gotten rid of our point of reference. So we can't identify the aggressive cancer, but it's already there. Okay? So we've moved our reference, our hallmark, our yardstick, the thing that we measure in order to determine that somebody has more aggressive cancer, and I worry about that a little bit. And, uh, and uh, maybe we're even treating patients who don't need to be treated. I continue to worry about that. By that I mean we're giving everybody a treatment for active surveillance, and the whole goal of active surveillance is not to treat patients. So I worry about that. We actually have a, a, a large trial going on where we are uh, giving patients HIFU who have Gleason 7 cancer. It's not just our institution, it's several other institutions in the United States. We've treated about, uh, about 15 patients so far. Uh, anecdotally, there are patients that we've biopsied that have absolutely no cancer on the repeat biopsy, and that's wonderful. We've saved them an intervention, radiation or surgery. Anecdotally, there are patients who have progressed, and I haven't really seen any patients that I thought we've done harm by uh, delaying their treatment, but it's entirely plausible that that's the case. These are our inclusion criteria, you know, low PSA, Gleason 7 cancer. They have to have an MRI visible lesion, uh, and we repeat the biopsy and the MRI, and the idea, as I said, is to go ahead and, and focally ablate the tumor, maybe leave a little bit of the Gleason 6 behind. We don't really care about that, but we want to get rid of the Gleason 7 cancer. Uh, it, has this improved? What's really improved is the imaging. So back in the day, we had poor imaging. We couldn't identify where the cancer is. That limits our ability to identify where it is. Believe it or not, this is a, a, an abnormality. I know it looks a little unclear, but this is an abnormality that's prostate cancer, biopsy proven. We go ahead and treat with a focal ablation. And this dark area here is where the cancer has been eradicated. This is the area that, where the prostate has not been touched. The neurovascular bundles are here and here and the idea is the patient will maintain their erections, maintain their continence, and, and also uh, still be eligible for surgery or radiation at a later date. And when patients have total gland HIFU with the entire gland is destroyed, uh, I don't know about the radiation therapy literature, but the surgical literature, it's very hard to do. I've operated on patients after the HIFU and they actually are, are it's a little harder, but not tremendously harder. So what about surgery? Uh, there's two randomized trials that have actually shown that surgery is uh, better than doing absolutely nothing. Uh, the first is uh, a study done out of Europe, uh, which basically showed that if you look at all patients, the patients who had surgery uh, were uh, more, less likely to die of prostate cancer. That's this little green bar. You can see there's more green here than here. Uh, importantly, they're also less likely to develop metastatic disease, less likely to be treated with androgen deprivation, and less likely ultimately to die, period. Uh, so uh, these are patients that actually appear to benefit. It shows that surgery actually works. There is a trial in the United States that uh, did not show a benefit. Uh, same idea, randomizing patients to surgery versus no surgery. Uh, the, uh, you don't need to know statistics. You just need to know that the p-value is the important parameter, and you want it to be 0.05 or less. That's about as close to 0.05 or less as you could get. So while it's not statistically significant, it, 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 it is very close. 
Uh, the, uh, there are some flaws in this study which would explain why they didn't become statistically significant. I think one of the important take home messages, clearly there was a lower risk of developing metastatic disease in this patient population. Uh, the reason why the study probably didn't work is the average age was an older gentleman. Uh, the patients didn't live uh, on average, they only lived about 10 years on average, uh, and that's not enough time to demonstrate an impact for any treatment. So uh, it sort of limited the ability of the study to demonstrate a benefit. Uh, there is a study out there that randomized surgery to radiation uh, and something called active monitoring. Uh, this study showed absolutely no difference between the two groups. Uh, importantly, again, they only have 10-year follow-up. Uh, only 10% of the patients have died. Uh, the majority of the patients had low-risk disease, three-quarters of them. So that would indicate to me that the majority of these patients possibly didn't need any treatment. Uh, uh, but I does, do think it supports the concept that when we treat somebody for sur with surgery or with radiation, they need to have a 10-year life expectancy in order to benefit from the intervention. Uh, and then I'm going to finish up just quickly by looking at the uh, robot surgery, which is something I do an awful lot of. Uh, this will horrify Dr. Ritchie to see all the different uh, gadgets and stuff we have to do with open surgery. Uh, the idea behind uh, minimally invasive surgery is that we don't have to do that. Now, why has the robot taken off? So I have a short video here which show, hopefully will project. Straight lap surgery is very, is very difficult. You're going to be amazed at how hard it is to just tie a knot doing it, doing it laparoscopically. And so that limited the use of minimally invasive surgery, okay? So uh, robot-assisted surgery has taken off. When you're doing something laparoscopically, you have uh, essentially chopsticks. And it's hard to do surgery when you have chopsticks. Uh, there are a lot of devices that make it easier. I'm not saying we don't do laparoscopy well. We do. It's an important tool. And sometimes people overuse the robot and spend a lot of money unnecessarily. But when you're doing difficult, careful surgery like prostate surgery, preserving the neurovascular bundle, preserving continence, the ability to use your wrists, whether an open procedure or via a robotic procedure, is really important in order to do a better job in order to get a better, more likely to get a negative margin, more likely to be able to improve continence and potency. So again, I can't see this. This is me sewing it. You can, you can just get a, an idea that it's much easier for us to go ahead and use our wrist to go ahead and, uh, and sew things off and tie things off without any difficulty. I think clearly we need less aggressive treatments for low risk disease. I love active surveillance. One of the things I love best about active surveillance, you put someone in active surveillance and they don't tolerate it well, you can change your mind and give them radiation or give them surgery. Whereas if I operate on you or Dr. D'Amico gives you radiation and you have a little regret, you can't, you can't put the prostate back and we can't pull the radiation out. Uh, surgery clearly improves survival. I think focal therapy is on the horizon. This is mostly about the imaging continuing to improve. If the imaging continues to improve, we'll be able to use this effectively. Uh, and I think uh, minimally invasive surgery is, is a good idea. Okay? So less aggressive uh, treatment in the right patient. Surgery improves survival in the right patient. Focal therapy has not arrived yet. Minimally, minimally invasive surgery for everyone. Thank you very much. So uh, can a robotic surgery be used for TERP? So I have two answers to this. The first is I saw a video. So a TERP is when you go for, it's not for prostate cancer, it's for uh, uh, having difficulty urinating. Uh, and you remove the inside of the prostate, which is usually not where the cancer is, uh, but you leave the outside alone. So I saw a, an amazing, when we say robotic surgery, it's not really, you have the idea that I push a button and the robot does a surgery. And the answer to that is no, it's me making a motion and the robot mimicking it. Uh, but I actually saw a, uh, a true robotic terp where somebody pressed a button and a machine cored out the inside of the prostate in about, I'd say about two minutes. I think Dr. Ritchie saw this video as well. It was incredible. I've never seen anything like it. And I, and I think that that is really the future of our field. For people who have very large prostates, by that, so a normal prostate is probably about 10 cc's. The average guy in his 60s or 70s, we're talking about 30 or 40 cc's. Every once in a while, somebody presents with a prostate that has 100, you know, it's 150 cc's. I mean, it's softball size. You can't do a terp on that. So we can do what's called a robotic simple prostatectomy, where robotically we remove the inside of the prostate. And that's a very effective surgery for the right patient. And, you know, we do them about once a month.
uh, but it's mostly for patients that have bigger prostates because TERP is clearly minimally invasive and probably a better, that's a quoring out, is clearly a better way to go if possible. Madam, they want you to talk about cryotherapy as a form of focal ablation. Yes, yeah, so. Yeah, so I think cryotherapy is, is, is another form of focal ablation. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, there, there are a couple of problems with it. Uh, the, the first is that the ice ball is hard to fall. So it forms a little ice ball. Not surprising, cryotherapy, you're freezing the prostate. And when you do it under ultrasound guidance, there's a shadow. You can't get the sound waves to go through the ice because the ice is solid. So you're not sure what's happening on the other side. So we actually have been doing this under MRI guidance. Now this isn't about identifying the lesion. This is about being able to follow the ice ball very precisely. And so you can get serial MRIs while you're delivering the uh, cryotherapy and exactly delineate exactly what you're freezing. The idea behind that is that you're not going to injure any organs that are near, uh, you know, near, the, near the ice ball because you can see on the other side of it. So yes, I think that's... Uh, I think it's reasonable. I want to emphasize for focal therapy, including cryo, there's no data out there that shows that anybody is going to live a day longer if the, they get these kinds of therapies. So you're taking a little bit, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I agree it makes a lot of sense. But there are a lot of things that make a lot of sense that don't get transmitted to actually improving patients' outcomes. So I think surgery was first used around 1900. Radiation therapy was first used around when? 1940, 1950? Early 1900s. Like yeah, early 1900s. So, uh, and those are still the mainstays of therapy. And the reason for that is people have come up with a lot of good ideas over the past uh, roughly 100 years, and they just haven't panned out. So I think the important thing is to test them in a, in, a, in a way that allows us to prove that they actually work. So when someone comes to you and says, I get this great treatment, I know that it works, ask for the data. There's no data that cryotherapy makes you look. I do it, I do it in the right patient but with the understanding that it's not been proven to make patients live longer. I get concerned sometimes about widespread Two questions on surveillance. Adam, the first one is somebody had an MRI 12 months ago, unremarkable, 22 months, PSA has been stable. He hasn't had a biopsy in two years. Does he need another one? I guess it depends a little bit when the, the first biopsy was. So my strategy is I do, a, a, the initial biopsy is when you diagnose the cancer. So the first thing I'm concerned about is that you could have missed the cancer, okay? Just missed it. So I go ahead and I get, an, I get an MRI on that patient if they haven't had one already, and I go ahead and I repeat the biopsy. That is when the majority of the upgrading actually occurs. Then I do one at two years, and then I don't do them, I do them every three years. So if this gentleman with a stable PSA and a negative MRI, if, you know, he's had a couple of biopsies, then I would probably leave him alone, okay? I would do it maybe a year later. Uh, I would, uh, if it was, you know, he had, that was his first biopsy and it showed high volume Gleason 6 cancer and the MRI was negative, I'd still want to repeat the biopsy. So the details are very important as to the timing of them. I mean, we make it sound like one size fits all, but it's not one size fits all. And one final question is, besides uh, MRI, biopsy, PSA, are there any new things on the horizon to assess progression on surveillance like PHI, 4K score, et cetera? You know, these, these uh, tests have not been used predominantly for patients uh, who have been diagnosed with cancer. They've been used for patients who are being evaluated to see where they have cancer. Uh, this is a study that we're actually going to use trying to integrate 4K score with MRI in patients that were diagnosed with disease to see if the combination of the two can predict how aggressive the cancer is. The, the tests that have been most useful in this uh, regard are tests that look at the biopsy. Uh, so there is a, a, a Polaris test, there is a Oncotype DS, uh, uh, an Oncotype test, there's another one called Decipher. All these tests uh, allow you to look at the underlying genetic makeup of the cancer cell and see whether genomics can help predict who a molecularly has a more aggressive type of cancer. Uh, and uh, I think they help, uh, but at the end of the day I've found uh, that patients interpret risk very differently and that's difficult for us to assess. So you'll tell a patient who gets one of these tests that they have a 3% risk of dying of prostate cancer at 15 years. That's what the test tells you, and the patient will be panicked. And you'll say, well, that's my risk. I don't have prostate cancer. I mean, that's the lifetime risk of dying of prostate cancer. And then you'll have other patients, I can't make this up, I saw a guy who had a 30% risk of dying of prostate cancer if we didn't do anything. This was low-risk disease. And I said, 
we should do something about this. And he said, ah, you know, that's okay, that's acceptable. And I found myself explaining what 30% meant to the guy. A hundred guys, 30 of them will be dead. And he said to me, Doc, I, I, I understand. I went to high school. I understand what percentages are. <laughs> he put me in my place pretty well. Uh, and he said, I just don't think I'm going to be alive in 10 years. And I said, you're either the most pessimistic or most realistic man I've ever met in my entire life. So thank you. Let's thank, thank Dr. Conway for his talk. Thank you. Next, we're going to introduce Dr. Jerome Ritchie, uh, who's come to us tonight, and he's going to talk about the beginnings, if you will, the diagnosis, detection, screening um, of prostate cancer, and then a little bit about uh, the management. You know, I've known uh, Dr. Ritchie since I came uh, to Boston in 1994, and he really served as a mentor uh, to me, and still he did academically way back when, and now more in terms of life. You'll hear from you know, those of you who know him, and you'll hear from sort of his presentation, his demeanor, that he is a man with great wisdom, as well as a man who has his values straight. One of the things I learned from Jerry very well is the idea of balance in life, you know, personally and professionally. Jerry. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Anthony. This was two wonderful talks. Uh, one on surgical management, one on advanced disease. Recognize that the advanced disease is the one that kills people. Uh, the localized disease, as long as it's localized, we can treat it with a variety of different therapies. But once it becomes castration resistant, that's where it gets tricky. Prostate cancer, 164,000 new cases a year. It accounts for 19% of all male cancer cases and almost 30,000 deaths per year. So it really is a significant problem. If you compare that to breast cancer in women, it's the number one incidence in men and women and the second leading cause of death in both men and women. So even though some may say this is an indolent disease, it's still killing almost 30,000 men a year, which is one man dying of prostate cancer every 15 minutes throughout the year in the United States. The issue with prostate cancer, and you've heard from Dr. Kybell about active surveillance, is that it's estimated that about a third of men over the age of 50, if you took out the prostate and very carefully step sectioned it, you would find a tiny focus of prostate cancer. Now that doesn't mean that 30% are going to die from prostate cancer, actually about 3% will die from prostate cancer. So this discordance between the 30% who have something and the 3% where it progresses and kills them is what's created the issues in terms of screening, in terms of treatment. And these are still controversial issues throughout the United States. This slide shows what's happened with PSA going back to the 1990s. You can see how the PSA went up and then down and has been in kind of a sine wave. And the bottom part is the deaths per year. There are three red bars or red arrows there. The first one in 2008 was the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force who came out and said there's not enough information for or against screening for prostate cancer. The second one, which was in 2012, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and this is an important group of primary care physicians, healthcare economists, et cetera, uh, whose recommendations are followed carefully by Medicare and others. And in 2012, they came out with a Class D recommendation. Class D meaning that screening did more harm than good. It's hard to believe, but that was the uh, conclusion that they drew, even with feedback from a variety of other urologists and others. Fortunately, they've reconsidered that, and now in 2018 have come back around to their senses, if you will, to say this is a class C recommendation, meaning that the patient should discuss the pros and cons with their doctor about screening. This is what happened to the screening rates after the 2012 recommendation. You can see the three bars uh, for 40 to 50, 50 to 69, and above 75, and the, uh, the uh, aqua bar uh, shows that there was a significant diminution in screening across all of these ages, 
men who were in their 50s, men who were in their 60s, and men who were in their 70s. So clearly this task force had significant impact on this recommendation because realistically, the urologists aren't doing the screening. The primary care physician or the internist are the ones that have to decide, should I screen or should I not? Interestingly, over that nine-year period, the mortality increased fairly dramatically. There was a 7% increase in metastatic prostate cancer per year, and the accumulation was 72%. And in fact, if you took men age 50 to 69, which is really the prime age for screening, it was almost 90% increase in metastatic prostate cancer. And those are the patients that are going to die from their disease. There were three randomized screening trials, which we've introduced before, the PLCO trial, the European trial, and the Gutborg trial. And the PLCO trial had some issues, did not show a significant difference, but the European trial showed a significant diminution, about 20% reduction in prostate cancer deaths. And the Gutborg trial, which was younger patients, showed almost a 50% reduction by the advocation of screening. A study recently showed that screening does reduce prostate cancer mortality. Uh, this group looked at mean lead time for both the European and the PLCO trial and basically concluded that both of these trials really influenced the mortality from prostate cancer. So I think it's fairly certain that screening has benefit, but do we overscreen and do we overtreat? And those are some of the issues to deal with. The recommendations by organization, the AUA, the American Urological, says shared decision making, age 55 to 70. The American Cancer Society, consult with the physician about risks and benefits. Primary medicine, discuss with the MD. And now the US Preventive Services Task Force is finally saying discuss the pros and cons with the physician. Now there was a question about alternatives to PSA. PSA is a member of the calocrine family, and it has been very valuable, but clearly not a perfect test. There are three other tests that are being evaluated. One is called a 4K score, which uses three or four different calocrines. One is called the Prostate Health Index, and a fairly new one from the Cleveland Clinic is called the ISO PSA. What we would really like is to have a screening test that identifies aggressive prostate cancer and does not identify indolent prostate cancer. So these are tests that are being evaluated and we'll have to see whether the data will hold up for those. Now one of the questions is can we use MRI? MRI as you saw from Dr. Kybell has clearly gotten better with three Tesla machines and interpretation. There was a study that was published in the New England Journal recently called the Precision Study and in this group, they took 500 men and randomized them to either an MRI first or a prostate biopsy first. And what they found is that 28% of the men who had the MRI did not even have to have a biopsy. Furthermore, clinically significant prostate cancer was seen with the MRI in 38% compared to 28% with the biopsies. So MRI is becoming better. The question in my mind is, do you do it first? My general philosophy had been to biopsy somebody and then if they're going on active surveillance to get an MRI because you want to be sure you haven't missed anterior lesions or other lesions. So I would use that and then target the, uh, the uh, additional areas on the MRI. Should you use it first? In Europe, that's being done a lot. But in Europe, the cost of an MRI is much less than it is in the United States. So this is something that's sort of being developed at the time, and we don't have definitive answers on whether MRI can improve screening, in whom should the MRI be done? And if the MRI is negative, do you need to do a biopsy? Again, this depends on the PSA, the clinical stage, a lot of other factors in there too. So careful analysis would support screening for prostate cancer. The uh, issue has to do with overtreatment and overdiagnosis. 
Clearly, we need to be able to identify patients with aggressive prostate cancer. And screening, if you pick up somebody with indolent disease, active surveillance is an excellent choice, as we'll hear about, but there's no free lunch. There are issues with active surveillance as well. So the prostate sits at the base of the bladder. The urine goes through the prostate like a straw through a golf ball, and uh, it provides fluid to nourish the sperm. And the standard has been in patients who have an elevated PSA or an abnormal digital rectal exam to do what's called a 12-core biopsy technique, taking cores medially and laterally in various parts of the prostate. And this has been an excellent technique to identify prostate cancer, but it will miss the cancers that are in the front or the anterior part of the prostate. These biopsies are mainly indicated to biopsy the back part or the posterior part of the prostate. So MRI has the advantage of being able to identify suspicious areas. There are different ways to interpret it. The, probably the most important is called apparent diffusion coefficient, or ADC. And if you see a suspicious lesion on MRI, the radiologist can put a scale on that. It's called a PIRAD scale. It goes from one to five and a three, four, or five are the ones that are most worrisome, especially the fours and fives. So if you do a biopsy, whether you do it targeted or sextant or whatever, then the pathologist can look at that and put a Gleason score. And they put two numbers on it. The first two, the one and the two, aren't really used anymore. So it's really a three, four, or five, and then you add the two together. So it might be three plus three or four plus five. Now, the problem with that is that a three plus three, which is fairly indolent, is already a six. So patients are saying, this is bad disease. And so the International Society of Urologic Pathology came out with something called grade grouping. And this is an ISUP grade. So a ISUP grade one is a three plus three. A grade two would be a three plus four, with four being the secondary component a three being a four plus three, meaning more four than three, and then you get into the more aggressive diseases, four plus five, five plus five, et cetera. And we also tend to stage these patients by how the prostate feels. Most of these are identified by what we call a T1C, identified on the basis of the PSA, either elevated or a change in PSA. A T2 is a small nodule, and a T3 is involving the seminal vesicle. And we're indebted to uh, Dr. D'Amico for this risk classification, which is still very useful, with a PSA less than 10, a Gleason less than or equal to seven, and a T stage of T1C, T2A being low risk, and you can read the intermediate and the higher risk. And these help to decide whether the patient is a good candidate for surveillance or whether they're a good candidate for active treatment. Then you get into should it be surgery, should it be radiation, should you add hormones. There's a lot of variation that uh, occurs in this. So these are the options for managing localized prostate cancer, active surveillance, radical radiation therapy, or radical prostatectomy surgery. You have to consider the age and the health of the patient, both their chronologic and their physiologic age, the extent of disease, and the associated morbidity. This is a slide looking at watchful waiting from many years ago, Peter Albertson, and I'd like you to focus on the red curves down at the bottom. That's a Gleason uh, 7 or a Gleason 8 through 10. So even with a 55-year-old, with a Gleason 7, many of those patients will die of prostate cancer, that's the red. And certainly a Gleason 8 through 10, that will be the case. The middle one is Gleason 6, and Gleason 6 can be a lamb, not an aggressive disease, but you have to be certain you haven't understaged the patient, and you need to follow them carefully. So we've seen a rise in active surveillance. This is from Matt Cooperberg at UC San Francisco was presented at the AUA last year, and it showed that active surveillance has increased from about 10% of the patients to about 40%. So we're clearly doing better in identifying which patients can be followed. 
But I still have concerns about active surveillance, especially in younger patients, because in the clot series, about a third of the patients end up getting treated within five years, and about a quarter of them have a biochemical recurrence. And that suggests to me that we don't have adequate trigger points to decide when it's appropriate to get off of active surveillance. So the ideal candidate, I would say, is a Gleason 3 plus 3 small volume disease. I worry about the 3 plus 4 because Gleason 4 disease is potentially lethal. And so I'm very cautious about using active surveillance in patients with Gleason 3 plus 4 disease. There are clearly risks to active surveillance. You have anxiety. You have the burden of repeated assessment with biopsies. You can have progression, delayed treatment, and adverse pathology at treatment. And I still say, can we identify the appropriate patients, and can we tell when it's time to stop active surveillance and move ahead with treatment? Now, there are predictive tests. You heard about these from Dr. Kybell, Oncotype, Prolaris, Decipher. All of these provide further risk stratification. Thus far, these are fairly expensive tests. And they really haven't, in my mind, shown us exactly who is going to progress. So I'm a little judicious in using these tests. There are multiple options. Uh, I think it's important to have adequate patient selection. Uh, older patients, somebody with comorbid disease, especially Gleason 3 plus 3, is an excellent candidate for active surveillance. Surgery can be robotic or open. Radiation therapy can be seed implants or external beam. Uh, and now there's non-standard focal therapy, which we heard about. One of the more sobering things is this data from the Aqua Registry from San Francisco, looking at CAPR risk. They have a different way in San Francisco of, of looking at risk from 1 to 10. And on the far left, you can see that even the ones that are CAPRA 1 only about 40% were getting active surveillance. So we've got a long way to go in terms of judicious use of active surveillance, but I think that that's probably the way to go for localized disease, and it has obviated the issue of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Issues about managing localized prostate cancer, Optimal treatment is controversial. I think everything about prostate cancer is controversial, from whether you screen, whether you biopsy, whether you treat, whether you put on hormones, whether you add super hormones. So unfortunately, there are a lot of different choices, and I think that Dr. Taplin is doing a nice job in trying to sort that out. Radical prostatectomy is more definitive because you're removing the prostate, you have adequate margins, and you have a good marker to follow because after surgery, the PSA should be unmeasurable by six weeks and should stay there. With radiation, it takes a while for the PSA to drop down, what we call a nadir, and then a definition of failure is nadir plus two points. Clearly, quality of life is important, and this is why patients have to kind of make their own decisions. And I think further improvements in survival will depend on the development of adjunctive therapies. Thank you very much. So the first question, Jerry, is they want to know about comparing you know, an MRI versus non-invasive MRI, one using nanoparticles or nanotechnology. Is there, what's the advantages and disadvantages? Yeah, I mean, the na nanotechnology is sexy because it's these tiny little areas that may prove better. Thus far, I haven't seen the data to be convinced that the nanotechnology is better than a 3T MRI. If, if the MRI is done using a 3 Tesla, which is a stronger magnet, and you have a good radiologist interpreting it, I think you have an excellent choice. But remember, these are what's called multi-parametric MRI. So they're doing a bunch of different sequences. They're looking at diffusion, diffusion weighted. They're looking at enhancement. They're looking at apparent diffusion coefficient. And all of these factors give a very good idea of using a PIRAD score. So I'm not convinced that the nanotechnology yet 
is better than a standard MRI. I mean, clearly, everybody is developing new technologies and studying them, and as the data come out, if it shows superiority, then I'll change, but for right now, I don't think so. I next want to know what the cost, uh, Jerry, of a PSA is. I'm sorry. A PSA test. What's the cost of a PSA test? The PSA test costs about $35 to $40. It's, it's a simple blood test, but the issue and the reason that the primary care physicians worry about it is, let's say you get a PSA and it's 4.5 and an otherwise healthy 60-year-old, is that just because of enlargement of the prostate or is it because he's harboring prostate cancer? I think that's where the benefit of having periodic or serial PSAs becomes much more advantageous because then you have a whole history. And if his PSA had been 2.5 all along, and most men in their 60s really have a PSA below 2.5, and then it's 4.5, I would worry. Uh, again, if the prostate is enlarged, that's a concern because the prostate makes PSA. Recognize that there are things that can impact on the PSA as well. Uh, urinary tract infection, prostatitis, uh, fairly significant bicycle riding, recent ejaculation. So all of these can be factors in the PSA and it's incumbent upon the urologist to look at that and say these are what your risks are and this is the benefit should we do a biopsy or should we not. So the next question is, uh, somebody uh, has just a enlarged prostate on rectal exam, but they have a family history of prostate cancer uh, in, a, in dad, let's say. Is there a particular PSA level that should trigger uh, an MRI-guided biopsy? Well, family history is always a concern, especially first generation, a father or a brother, and especially if that individual developed prostate cancer at a younger age. So these are all additional risks. Um, there is a, a, a technique called a free and total PSA, uh, looking at how much of it is bound to proteins in the blood and how much circulates free. And that can help in patients with an enlarged prostate. If the free PSA is 25% or greater, then it's highly likely that the PSA is just related to enlargement of the prostate. Can biopsy cause the prostate cancer to spread? We've never seen that. Uh, theoretically, you're poking little holes in it, and this might be an avenue for something to leak out. However, in patients who've had biopsies and then had surgery, we don't tend to see a track where the cancer is going outside. So I would say absolutely not. The biopsy does not cause the cancer to spread. And how often is a biopsy negative, but there really is cancer there? In other words, the biopsy missed the cancer. So it's estimated that about 30% of prostate biopsies will be positive uh, on the initial 12 core biopsy. That doesn't mean that 70% don't have prostate cancer. This is where the MRI has helped because if we see a high pyrads lesion, we're going to target that on a second biopsy rather than putting that patient on active surveillance. So this is part of the reason why you do more than one biopsy, that there is a sampling of the prostate, and you're really doing kind of random biopsies. It would be nice to say, well, we're doing an ultrasound, maybe we'll see a shadow there that we can target, but 95% of the time the ultrasound is negative. This is where the MRI has been very valuable. And the last question, Jerry, just to clarify, what do you, do you mean by aggressive prostate cancer? Is it just more established prostate cancer that's been there longer? What does more aggressive mean? So the higher the Gleason grade, especially four component, three plus four and especially four plus three, is much more aggressive, much more likely to spread beyond the prostate. And so when we talk about relatively indolent prostate cancer, it would be three plus three. But as you get to three plus four and especially four plus three, these are cancers that ultimately can spread outside the prostate. So I'll finish off here with, with the last talk. But a few things I want to say before we start. You know, I had a chance, you know, over the time that we've been here so far to look through the room. You know, I recognize 90% of the people here. And it's, you know, I have to say this, every, I say this every year, but for those who haven't heard it, 
it's really an absolute privilege for me to know that so many people sitting here have entrusted their lives, themselves, their families, in some sense, to my care and the care that the team that I have provides. You know, I never thought when I was a young one that I would be a doctor. I was good with numbers. I was thinking I was going to be a mathematician, later a physicist. And what brought me to medicine was not actually uh, anything that you know, one would have, would have thought of, except just it's life experiences. And I realized that there are no accidents. What happens over time is put there on purpose to get you to where you, exactly where you need to be. And I do believe that every person I've had the privilege of taking care of comes you know, to me for a reason, that it's not just to take care of a cancer, it's actually to develop a relationship uh, and something more personal than they may have had otherwise. Because we develop friendships and, and this association over those eight, nine weeks of treatment that in follow-up that goes far beyond you know, what really could have happened in either of our lives had we not met. The team that I work with is fantastic. I cannot do any of these things that I do without them. Many of you, Marion Lafredo has been working with me for 24 years. I don't know how many doctors are blessed and privileged to actually work with a nurse for almost their entirety of their career. I became an attending physician 24 and a half years ago when I met Marion three months after that, and she's been with me throughout that entire time. I've had amazing assistants. Many of you, knew, if you were here 10 years ago, knew Kristen Valentine who later left the practice because she had her first child at the age of 40. And now I must say that I saw uh, her son recently. He's eight years old and, and, and just amazing you know, to watch Kristen, you know, who was a school teacher first, then came to be my assistant and now has a, a young boy. Joanna Ruder more recently has, has joined the team and has been wonderful. And Beth McMahon has been a person who has spearheaded the research part of what I do for, for years. And so, you know, I'll, I just want to recognize them because I can't stand here alone and make you think for a minute that, you know, that anything that I do with you or even tonight is possible without the help and the organization of all of these people. So I'm going to talk to you mainly about a spectrum of clinical trials that have happened in uh, this last uh, year. And you've heard about some of them, but I'll, I'll kind of just bullet them. Some of them will be new. Some of them will be some things you've heard tonight. But I want to bullet the clinical relevance of them. And before I start that, I just I said earlier uh, in the evening that around 7, 7.15, my wife would be walking through the door. And my wife is here, Diane, in the pink shirt, who's standing now sort of in the back. And I'm, you know, that's the balance in my life. And, you know, another, another thing that would have never, something I never would have imagined, you know, would have happened to me so early in life, at the age of 19, being called to jury duty. And there she was, you know, picked for the same jury. You know, who would imagine that that's how you'd meet the person? Because at that age, at 19, I was like this. It was all about work. You know, there was nothing else in my life except school. And then, you know, sequestered to a courtroom for three days, it's hard uh, to miss. So I, I know, Diane, you need to go. So thank you for being here and coming and showing up every year for 20 years, you know, to say hello. And I'm going to give my wife a hand. <laughs> All right, so I always start these uh, talks with a story, and uh, I hope that this one, um, it's not one you've heard before, because I just, a patient gave it to me literally a week and a half ago. And I'm going to blame any of the political incorrectness on this, not by uh, the patient who gave it to me nor me, but by the players that are in this, which are three former presidents. So the story is this. Uh, President Trump is asking you know, some very famous past presidents, sort of in a dream, because they no longer exist in life, um, you know, how he can help uh, improve running of the country. And so the first person he speaks to is FDR. And FDR says to him, you need to create programs and opportunities that will provide more jobs. And President Trump looks and says, mm, no. The next one is George Washington. And George Washington says, above all things, honesty. You have to tell the American people exactly, exactly the way it is. And he says, mm, no. And finally, he speaks to Abraham Lincoln. <clears throat> and Abraham Lincoln says, I think uh, you should visit the theater. <laughs> All right. OK. I don't take any responsibility for, for that. OK, so what's on this first slide? This first slide is something I, I concocted, because I think it actually has a lot of relevance to understanding screening. So there's three plots, and as you look at them, the one that's furthest to um, your left, it says ERSPC, which is a, a study that came out of Europe, 
And it is the one screening study on this entire slide that actually shows that PSA reduces death from prostate cancer. The one in the middle, uh, which came from the UK, and the one on the far extreme that came from the United States does not. However, I want you to see something very important. So if you wanted to know whether a screening test works or not, ideally what you want to do is you want to have a group of people who get it and a group of people who don't, right? Because if you, if you have a group of people who get it and another group of people who get it and you compare the two, you can't see a difference. That was the US study. You see the 0%? It turns out that on both arms of the screening study and the US study, both people, both arms got PSA. And they say, well, it doesn't work. Well, of course it doesn't work. You're comparing the same two things. How can you see a difference? And that's, I mean, that's a little simplified, but that's the bottom line. What about the middle? The middle is the UK study. And the UK study is a wonderful study. They got a single PSA in men between the ages of 50 and 69 and asked, does that help? And it turned out that because in the UK there's active discouragement, even if you get the PSA from going for a biopsy and following up, that when you actually look at the number of people who followed through, who got a PSA on one arm versus who did not and who followed up with the biopsy, the difference between the two arms is only 21%. So again, 80% of the people on one arm either you know, didn't get the PSA if they were supposed to or didn't follow up. And so you can't really see a separation in those curves until 12 years. It's, they start to separate at the very, very far extreme at 12 years. And I find that interesting given that there's only a 20% difference in screening. Now let's look at the one back on the left where they do see a significant difference after seven years. Okay. What's the difference in the screening on the two arms there? It's about 50%. So one arm got it, and the other arm got it only half the time. And you still get a difference in cancer death. So if you just extrapolate now to a curve that doesn't exist, to the left of this screen, where 100% either get it or no one gets it, I would project that just based on the fact that those lines don't separate, separated 12 years, separated seven years, that they'd be separating maybe at three, four, or five years, that you'd see a reduction in cancer death rather quickly. And this is why I think you know, PSA has been under understood, is because the first study to come out was the one on the right from this country that showed you know, no difference, later the one on the left, and that got people to think differently about PSA. And in fact, it got the US Preventative Task Force this past year to change their recommendation from D, which says don't do it, to C, which says talk about it, and we need to get it back to B, which says, talk about it and do it. Um, so we're slowly getting there. And I will tell you that you know, with time, that curve on the left will get more and more significant um, because that's what these curves tend, tend to do. So that's screening. I believe that PSA should be done. If you have had prostate cancer, your son should get one as a baseline when he's 35, 40, and every year thereafter. There's no proof for that, but it's common sense in my mind. Just make sure, as Dr. Ritchie said, they don't have bike riding or ejaculation a week before, so their PSA is not uh, artifactually elevated. This is the whole thing. You've heard this from Dr. Keibel. You've heard this from Dr. Ritchie, this whole thing about MRI-guided biopsy. What's the bottom line? The bottom line that is in this study, if you got an MRI-guided biopsy, you were more likely to find significant prostate cancer, Gleason 3 plus 4 or higher, than if you did not. But it also showed that if you got the MRI done, you could also rule out people who didn't need a biopsy about a quarter of the time. So MRI is in advance. Now, it's interesting. On my way here tonight, I was reading this thing that's about to be printed in what's called the Oncology Times. The Oncology Times is a throwaway, as we call it. It's something that comes like a magazine for oncologists and, and doctors who treat cancer. And there's an editorial in there from somebody who I know well, a guy named Jim Hugh, who used to work at the Brigham uh, and who now actually is in New York. And he's commenting on MRI. And, and there's a lot of value in what he says. Um, he says, can we use MRI now you know, for everybody? And he says, well, we could, but there's two problems. One is it costs a lot. And he puts the numbers in anywhere from $250 to $4,000, depending upon insurance. But that can be fixed. You know, that can be fixed by basically you know, having uh, the radiologist come up with something that actually makes it affordable. Uh, and then the second thing he says is, and this, one, this is the one I actually uh, do take, uh, do agree with him on, and, and that is that not everybody does it well, and that's true. You have to get the MRI at a place where the radiologist actually is looking and knows well how to give that score, one, two, three, four, five. 
If you just go anywhere and get one done and they've only looked at one once a month or once a week, it's going to not be any, of any use and therefore the information not valued. In this trial that was in the New England Journal, the radiologists were experienced. And so I think the bottom line is an MRI is very wise who should get it. If you've been diagnosed with a Gleason 6 and whoever the doctor is says to you, I think you should consider surveillance, fine. But I would tell you, you should have an MRI first before you go on surveillance. Because this study suggests that even in men with Gleason 6, you're going to find significant cancer, not always, but sometimes. And I'd like to know that now, rather than waiting three or four or five years for a biopsy using ultrasound to find it. Because if you have Gleason 7, the curability of it now is better than it would be three, four, five years down the road. I think that's the bottom line with MRI. I use it in people who come to me who have Gleason 6, say they've said, let's do surveillance, and I say, okay, well, let's just make sure before we go there. Protect. You heard about this one as well. This is the big study comparing surgery to radiation and hormonal therapy. The bottom line from this study is that they couldn't find a difference in cancer death after 10 years, whether you had radiation or surgery. However, if you were monitored, and someone was asking me what monitoring means. Monitored means they get a PSA once a year, but they don't do biopsies, they don't do MRIs. They only trigger additional studies if the PSA goes up significantly. So that's what monitoring is as opposed to surveillance, where you get the biopsy, you get the MRI. And so what they found was that in the guys who got treated after 10 years, there wasn't a difference in cancer death, but I wouldn't expect there to be because what was the absolute cancer death rate? It was 1%. How are you going to measure a difference between 1% and 0.5%? And is it relevant, right, a half percent difference? But what, there was a difference in one thing that you know, wasn't in the media but certainly was in the editorial, which, which I wrote to make sure it was there, and that is that the metastatic rate doubled in men who were treated excuse me, in men who were watched, monitored versus treated. So that's the thing that got my attention. And while they say oh, it was only 6% versus 4 versus 3%, it's the thing at the top of the slide, and the p-value 0004, very significant. Oh, it's only a 3% increase. Yeah, it's only a 3% increase at 10 years. But if you're 55 years old and you're going to live 30 years, there's a 3% increase in the first decade, and that could be 6% in the next decade, and then 12% in the next decade. And so by the time you get to the end of, of time for your particular life, if you're diagnosed in your 50s and you go on what's called monitoring, you have you know, a 1 in 8 to 1 in 9 chance of getting metastatic disease over your lifetime, even if you get treated later, because they all got treated later. Two-thirds of them did on the monitoring arm. And so I'm not so sure you know, that in some, this data says to me you've got to be cautious with monitoring, Maybe surveillance is better. We're not even sure of that. There's never been a randomized trial of monitoring versus surveillance. What's the bottom line? If you have a Gleason 6 cancer, get an MRI. <laughs> Make sure there's nothing else there. And then if you're young and healthy, I favor treatment. If you're someone who's got you know, some other health issues and someone says to you, this is the least of your problems, and they know what they're talking about, fine. OK, now what's this? There's a bunch of numbers. This is about this kind of radiation where they do it in four weeks or five weeks instead of eight or nine weeks. Is it for you? So these three studies show that if you do it in four or five weeks as opposed to eight or nine weeks, that the cancer control, the recurrence rates are the same or similar. That's true. And if that was the answer, that's all we'd be doing. So why are we not all doing it? We're not all doing it because... It only applied to men with Gleason 7. Let's start there. It didn't apply to Gleason 8, 9, or 10. So intermediate risk only. Second, it was only, these men were only followed, 1, 2, 3, 4, the fourth column over from the left. You see it says 5.8, 5.2, 6.0. Those are the number of years, on average, men were followed. And you'd say, well, that's a pretty long time. But not really. It's not long enough, as you heard from Dr. Keibel, 10 years is before you start to actually see what cancer control looks like. But the other thing that you don't really know when you give the radiation in a shorter course, that is you give a lot more each day, as opposed to giving a little bit each day and gentler, is you don't know what the long-term side effects are going to look like. And we've learned this 20 years ago. I went to this meeting called ASTRO for the first time, and I'll never forget, her name is Patty Eiffel. She's now a professor down in Houston at a place called MD Anderson, and she was presenting as a young attending, um, you know, the first data 
that was 10 years out in the GYN literature of late effects after radiation for cervix cancer, endometrial, et cetera. And she, had the, she, had, she was in the plenary session, like the one where everybody comes to because this is the best news of, and the most important news of the meeting. She was in the plenary session because it was the first data to show what happens after, 10 years later after radiation when you give, like we did back then in GYN cancers, very high doses of radiation. And so that's what this is. This is very high doses of radiation given each day to the prostate to shorten the course. But we only have five or six years of follow-up. And we already see, if you go all the way over, if you look at the one that says CRUK, three, three rows down and go all the way to the right, there's a p-value there. It says 0.07. That's comparing men who got the short course versus the long course of radiation in terms of late genitourinary side effects, bleeding through the urine out of the bladder, stricture of the urethra, meaning you need a turp. You need to go in and open things up because it scars down. Stricture of the bladder neck, which means now you have less bladder capacity, so you're urinating every hour because your bladder can't hold much urine. They're starting to see more of that in the short course radiation arm at the very end of this particular trial. But that's only 5.2 years. What will it be at 7, 8, 9, or 10? So who should have a short course of radiation? Number one, Gleason 7, not 8, 9, or 10, because that's only 7s in this study for the most part. Number two, somebody who has no risk predisposing them to those things I just talked about. So nobody who's on Coumadin or any other anticoagulant that can cause you to bleed more easily. Nobody who's ever had surgery on the prostate, a TERP, you know, where they go in and they take out the center to open things up because that will predispose you to a stricture. Nobody who already has significant urinary symptoms, they're getting up every hour during the night or they have, quite a, they have a hard time starting the stream or a hard time stopping the stream. Those people are setups for those late effects. So who should have it? Gleason 7, perfect stream. Don't get up at night to urinate every four to six hours during the day. No anticoagulants and no surgery on the prostate in the past. Then they're at the lowest risk for having a late, late effect. And that's the small group of people we'll consider it in. Because what are you really getting out of it? Just convenience. One less month of time traveling in and out to get treatment for, for what is equivalent cancer control and potentially more late effects, more late side effects. I would only do it, I only do it in people whose the risk of late side effects is essentially zero. Okay, now this one, how much hormonal therapy to give? So this study finally got published this past year, the 36 versus 18 month study. And what's important is what's in blue. And you can see that 1.59 and then you see the 1.29. So what do these numbers mean? So when they first reported this study, uh, now four years ago, the follow-up was 6.4 years, they said that there was no difference if you gave 18 versus six months of hormonal therapy to men with Gleason 8, 9, 10, high-risk disease, who were getting radiation in terms of outcome, in terms of survival, death, et cetera. But the problem was is that what that blue number represents in that uh, bracket is how certain are we that they really are equal? Equal means one. One, one and one, not 159 means 59% worse potentially at one extreme. And so no one accepted it. So now four more, three, four more years go by and now you look at it and now the number is 1.02. So it's close to one. And the worst case scenario is 1.29. And so now you have to ask yourself, is that a good, is that a good idea or not? The 1.29 is the upper, this is the, the math of it. It's the upper limit of what's called the 95% confidence interval on whether they're truly equal or not, the 1.02. And so it says that with you know, 95% certainty, you can say that they are equal to within you know, 20, 20, 30%, 8, 1 to 1.29. So a doctor has to sit down and think about this with the patient and say, if I give you 18 months instead of you know, two years or 36 months, you know, three years, you'll have a better quality of life because you'll have less hormonal therapy. But there's a chance you know, at the extremes that it may not be as good. And so that's something, at the conversation we have to have. So how do I make this decision? If I make the decision, I look at the person and I figure out the side effects of hormonal therapy can affect heart, can affect blood counts, can affect mood, can affect thyroid. 
and I look to see, do they have any of these predisposing issues already? Do they already have heart disease? Do they have diabetes? Do they have problems with depression? If the answer is yes to all of those, then I favor a shorter course because I'm gonna make them miserable in the short term for something they may not see 10, 15 years down the road. But if they have none of those things, and you've, many of you have heard me say this, I say, okay, well, let's go. Let's see how you're doing at six months. Then we'll see how you're doing at 12 months. And if you're tolerating it, fine. We'll go the full, the full course. And if not, we'll cut out at 18 months. And so that's how I think about it because it's not obvious to me that they are equal. Um, there's some evidence to suggest they are, but the question is in whom. This is the concept of personalizing medicine, making sure that the person who's treating you is taking not only the cancer into account, but taking you into account too. Okay, new directions. These drugs you heard earlier, abiraterone, enzalutamide, apalutamide, all I wanna say about them is, is on this final slide here. So this, these two trials were published in the New England Journal this year. And these really are in advance. So this shows that in men who've undergone either radiation or surgery, and then the cancer comes back, the PSA rises, and they go on hormonal therapy, usually Lupron, and the PSA comes down, but then it goes back up again, despite being on Lupron, what do you do? These two drugs, enzalutamide and apalutamide, have been shown in those settings particularly if the PSA is rising fast, to delay significantly the time to the cancer spreading outside of the prostate and into bone. And the FDA approved both of these drugs based on that indication, which really is a landmark, because never in prostate cancer have any, has anything been approved based on delaying time to metastasis. I actually think that's a great idea. We've been doing that in breast cancer for over two decades, and they just did it this year in prostate cancer because they finally recognized that living with metastatic disease is not easy and that preventing it is a good thing. Before that, they only would, would approve something if it prolonged someone's life, which is a great thing, but I think prolonging life and delaying metastasis are both important things. So those two drugs have now been approved um, at the time of a PSA that's rising despite reinstituting hormonal therapy for a PSA rise because they've been shown to delay the time to metastasis. And you know, I'm sure with more time and follow-up, we'll see that they also probably improve curability. A little more time will tell. What I'm gonna do is, I have a little more to show, but I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna take some questions that you have. So if you have them, write them on your card. And then what I'm gonna do after that is I have five minutes left after this, I'm gonna show you something before we finish the session um, that I think will be interesting to you. So questions that anybody has, please raise your hand and we will pick up your card and we'll bring them to the front so I can take care of them for you. Thanks. Okay, so the first question is, what about after you've had Lupron, how quickly is it uh, till the sex drive, thank you, libido returns? So it depends on how much you got and, and the age. So it'll give you some benchmarks. If you are 50 years old and you got six months of Lupron, your libido will return within a couple of months. If you are 75 years old and you got six months of Lupron, it could take two to two and a half years for the libido to return. And so I'm just being quite frank. And what, how does that, where does that come from? Where it comes from, uh, thank you, is from the fact that as we age, the cells in the testicles called the Leydig cells that make testosterone that give us our libido age. And so if you turn them off for six months at 50, they more easily get turned back on, but they, they're more sluggish as we get older. So the return of libido after Lupron depends upon how much you got and your age. The general rule of thumb is if you're in your 60s to 70s, you can take the amount of time that you got the Lupron and multiply it by two in terms of thinking how, long, how quickly it will come back. So 65-year-old, six months of Lupron, about a year till everything fully returns to normal. All right, of all the academic hospitals in the Boston area, who has the best MRI? Okay. <laughs> Our patients improve with robotic surgery. So I'm getting to say all these things and everybody's not here. Um, all right, the MRIs in Boston are actually quite good. So the BI, the Brigham, the General, they really all, thank you, all have very good um, MRI. And what I worry about is when you go out into a place where uh, there's very, thank you, very little in terms of people who are expert radiologists and who actually just do 
MRIs, if you will, of one area. Thank you. And you know, I can I go when I go around the country to teach. Something, let's say I go to San Francisco or I go to Chicago. I go to the university and I teach there because I get invited to teach there. But then I spend a few extra days and I'll just take a drive 50, 15, 20 miles outside the city into the communities. And I'll teach there because that's really who needs the teaching. The academic centers don't need me to teach them, thank you. They already know what they're talking about. It's really the community practices. What's happened today is there are more and more community practices. Like for example, Newton Wellesley is attached to MGH, right? Metro West is attached to the BI. Right, the Milford South Shore Cancer Center is attached to the Brigham. So you have more and more of these centers attaching themselves to academic centers so that they have access to the education that they're getting in Boston and so that way they have better quality equipment. But what I would say to you is that if you are going to have an MRI at a facility outside of a major city where there's a major academic center, ask somebody in the academic center if that peripheral satellite facility really as good as the one in town because I think it's very important to make sure that what you're getting you know, is going to be something that you can, can count on and be reliable in terms of the result. Okay, let's see. What's the Gleason score? So the Gleason score is a number that runs from 6 to 10 that a doctor called a pathologist assigns when he looks at the biopsy material under the microscope. Six are the ones that often don't spread but you have to make sure it really is a six. That's why we do the MRI and make sure we haven't missed anything. Sevens are almost always curable 90% of the time, but you have to treat them. You don't watch sevens. Eight, nines, and tens are the ones that we have to be more creative with. Those are the ones that require more than one treatment to get a good cure rate. And it's just what they look like under the microscope. A six looks very organized, whereas a 10 is completely disorganized. So in terms of the Gleason score, the question is, if you get 12 cores, and how do you tell what the Gleason score is? Because some of them have, you use the highest number. So if one core is a six and one core is a seven, that's called a Gleason score seven because you always treat the worst case scenario. You don't want to treat the least case scenario. All right, let's see other types of cancer as well. All right, are there associations with having other types of cancers, colon, thyroid, um, associated with having prostate cancer. So this gets back to genetic screening. So earlier um, you heard uh, from Dr. Taplin that Dr. Sweeney had recommended a genetic screening right in a gentleman here. And so what's that all about? There are some genes that cross over. So there is a, some certain genes that cause prostate cancer that also are associated with a higher risk of colorectal cancer. So if someone's had prostate cancer, you definitely get your screening colonoscopies. The risk, though, of getting colorectal cancer if you had prostate cancer is very small, right? It's in the single digits, a couple of percent. But if you have a certain gene, something called the Lynch syndrome, then the number could be much, much higher. Bladder cancer is another one, another very, very small chance of getting a bladder cancer if you have prostate. So there is a link, and the way you figure out that link is, is through genetic screening. So in terms of clinical trials, the Dana-Farber and the Brigham, we have many, many clinical trials that are offered, and I certainly think that if anybody has, you know, been diagnosed with Gleason 8, 9, or 10 prostate cancer, those are the people who should hear about clinical trials. Or if you've been treated and the cancer recurs, and you've gone through Lupron and it's recurred again, those are the times you should definitely consider clinical trials, because that's, those are the situations where a clinical trial, you know, may provide potentially some benefit. How long does radiation stay in your body? So that's a good question. So, you know, if you're getting the kind of radiation that comes from the outside, the linear accelerator, the machine that goes around you, it doesn't stay in your body at all. You're in the room, the machine goes on, the radiation goes through you, and the machine turns off, and there's no radiation in you. If you're getting the radiation pellets, or the seeds, they're inside and they're decaying for months. But the way it works is that that kind of radiation that's put in by seeds, the path length, the amount that the radiation travels is so small, it's about this much, it's millimeters, so it never gets out of your body. That's why you're allowed to, you know, now they used to be this thing, can't put kids on your lap if you've had the radiation seeds. That's not true. They have to do a test on you before you leave the hospital with basically what's the essentially a very sensitive Geiger counter, and they put it right over the area, you know, where the, we call the perineum. And if there's any detectable number that's more than what's coming from the sun, you can't leave the hospital. And so, you know, essentially there's no, the radiation does not stay in the body. It's the kind we give today comes in, does its job, and is out. 
Okay, so that's a good question. So the last slide I showed you about enzalutamide and apalutamide, you know, somebody is asking about what do I mean by a rapidly rising PSA? So the strict definition for those who like math was it had to double more quickly than every 10 months. So the way you get it is if you look at your PSA level and you're on Lupron and let's say it's 0.5, six months later if it's one, it's doubled in six months. That's called, that's definitely rapidly rising. I use a six month rule. If the PSA doubles in less than six months, that's a situation where agents like the ones shown on the slide are important if you're already on Lupron and the PSA has risen. Okay, <laughs> I like this one. Could the European screening trial have been more successful um, because the Europeans uh, prescribe things called botanicals? Um, actually, uh, that I, if that was true, we would have to have a, a new industry in this country as well. But the truth is that the European study is successful because people on that study actually adhered to the rules, either got the PSA or they didn't. And it just shows efficacy of the test more so than it shows um, any other alternative. Okay, following a normal course of radiation nine weeks, what is the chance of recurrence? Okay, so recurrence after radiation or recurrence after surgery comes back to that highest Gleason score. So if the Gleason score was seven, recurrence is on the order of 10 to 15%, most of which you can take care of with salvage treatments like hormonal therapy. The Gleason score is eight, the recurrence is about a third, and again, most of them whom you can take care of with salvage treatments. If it's a Gleason score nine or 10, then recurrences can be quite high. They can be as high as one half to two thirds of the time. And some of those can be still taken care of, but some will progress. And the ones that progress really are the people who should be aimed you know, in thinking about clinical trials because that's where we need to do the most good. <laughs> Did Diane find you guilty on the trial? <laughs> My wife. <laughs> I wasn't on trial. <laughs> I, like, I don't know who wrote that one, but that's very funny. Um, not on the trial, but at home. Um, okay. Let's see here. What, what score are you? Okay, and then success rate. Oh, last question here. What's the success rate with salvage seeds or salvage brachytherapy? So if we send you for salvage brachytherapy, it's because we think that the cancer is just confined to the prostate. If you look at the studies that have been done, the success rates look about 50% long term, 10 years. But I think that that is, comes from a time when the selection wasn't as good as it is today. We're much, much better at selecting people for salvage seeds now. The latest data we have, you know, that's more recent, suggests the number closer to be 60 to 70%. Okay, now the last thing I'm gonna show you here um, is something that I think is more personal. Um, many of you know that I spend about half my time at Harvard Medical School where I have become the advisory dean for the school. So I oversee, you know, about 160 students who come in every year and I, I take them on their path from the, when they first walk in and they don't know anything about medicine until you're shaking their hand on this podium and they're getting their, their degree, their MD, and then they're going off to become interns and residents. And I've learned something very important during the time that I've been doing this now for 15 years and that is that you know, it's so important that you help people when they're young in mind and heart to keep the principles straight. I started out this talk by saying, you know, how, you know, humbling it is for me to know that many of you have entrusted, you know, your lives, your family's well-being into the care of the team that I oversee, you know, in terms of your treatment. And that's what I try to teach these young, young emerging doctors is that practicing medicine is a privilege. It's a privilege because of who you get to take care of. It's not, it's not like you, know, you, you need to be glorified because you're a doctor. You are lucky to be one, to have the brilliance and the intelligence to be able to do it and the compassion and the heart to try to do it. So this here about lessons learned along the way, I, t I give this in the first week of medical school to the students. I put it by Anthony because they know me as this professor and internationally renowned whatever, but I show them right away that humility is important and I tell them to call me Anthony because I want them to learn when they become a doctor they should be called too, whatever their first name is because it's important to maintain humility because if you don't maintain humility in medicine, you'll never last because you can't fix everything. You can certainly help everyone, but you can't fix everything. I teach them about mentorship and I go through the attributes of a mentor. But the one that I want to show you here that I think is important is number one, loving. 
and you know, the overall well-being of the mentee is the goal. And I teach them that they not only have to take care of their patients, they have to love them. They have to love them not in some romantic sense that the 22-year-olds think about when I first talk to them, but to love them because these are human beings that have entrusted themselves to you, and they're coming to you at a vulnerable time in their life, and they're showing you their vulnerability. They're showing you, you know, a weak point. You know, and you know, you're going to have a weak point one day too, and you're going to want the person on the receiving end not just to treat your disease, but to treat you as a person. This is a picture of Anthony Zeitman and I. We run the residency in the Harvard Radiation Oncology Residency. This is us at a resident dinner, and there's a piece of salmon that we're holding up there. But the reason why I show it to you is not because both of us are old and bald, but because, you know, in fact that, you know, we're smiling because the person taking the picture are the two chief residents. And, and the chief residents are, you know, the ones who now are becoming the leaders in the residency. And it makes us happy to see, you know, their growing sense of responsibility for the younger doctors that they have to look after along the way. This is a lesson I learned, you all know this. You can have, you can have it all, but not all at once. You know, in medical school, everybody wants it now. I want to know, I'm going to be able to do this, I want to be able to do that. No, one step at a time. And that prevents burnout. You hear this suicidal rates and doctors and burnout, why? Because they're always like this, next step, next step. You know, one step at a time. Everything happens for a reason, and I teach them to keep a log. Every time something happens to them that upsets them, something happens to a family member, something happens to them, they get in a skiing accident, they rip their ACL, write it down that that happened. And six months later, a year later, come back and log into your book or your computer or however you keep it, your iPad, what happened next? What did you learn from this experience? Because I know if they do this, they'll realize that everything in life has a reason. And I do believe, as I said earlier, that every person I've gotten the privilege to meet came into my office and had a chance to, to meet and talk. It happened for a reason, too. I know why it, why it was what the reason was for me, and you know what the reason was for you. And it's not just about treatment. Expectations. I teach them to be humble because they're going to get disappointed because their expectations are like this, which is great. But they're not always going to be able to achieve everything that they want to achieve in that moment or even in that year or maybe ever. And so they have to be realistic that they're human, they're imperfect, they're going to make mistakes, they need to admit it. And if they stay this way, then they will actually grow and become wise, as opposed to burning out and spiraling down. Finally, this is the last piece. Everybody has a gift, but few are aware of it. To become aware of the gift, look for a change in someone, someone's behavior as a result of interacting with you. And then once you see what you've done to change a behavior in someone, you've shared your gift. And I'm going to show you this final slide. This is a picture of me. You know, many of you know I do martial arts. But I went to St. Jude's, which is in Memphis, Tennessee, where they have um, this amazing children's hospital, St. Jude's Hospital for Children with Cancer. What's amazing about it is it's completely funded through philanthropy. They raise over a billion dollars a year, I'm not exaggerating, to fund this place. You've been to movie theaters, sometimes you'll, you'll see, you know, advertisements for St. Jude's Hospital for Children with Cancer because the children who come there and their families are all treated for free. Their room and board is free. They put them up in hotels, their transportation, and all the care is free for these kids with cancer. In this country, there are 8,000 children who get cancer each year. Half of them are leukemia, a quarter are brain tumors, and a quarter are everything else, kidney tumors, bone tumors, et cetera. And this is a place that does this because there was a guy, you know, who, I don't know if you know the um, Danny Thomas and his daughter, that girl, I forget her name. Right, Marlo Thomas. So Danny Thomas's vision, you know, was to have this place. He set it up, and his daughter Marlo took it over now, and she's actually married, I believe, to Phil Donahue, who used to do the Today Show, um, or the Tonight Show. So they run the, the, the overseeing the philanthropy. So I went there, and I, because I got to know some of the people who worked there, and I went there, and this, I did a martial arts demonstration. And the way I did it was this way, and this is, I want to close with this, because this is an important message. Normally when I do a martial arts demonstration, I have my whole Taekwondo team, right? Because I teach a class here in Boston and, and a few other places. So I have all these students, 20 year olds who can jump up in the air, break boards and so forth. I can do that too, but I'm careful now. I want to keep my knees and, <laughs> right. So I get there of course, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, Taekwondo demonstration. I got 100 kids in the room like this. I said, how am I gonna, what's gonna happen? How am I gonna do this? So what I thought was an hour before the children arrived, I asked the um, child life specialists who oversee the children, 
can you ask either the moms or the dads to come and meet with me in advance? And so I got about 15 moms who came. And I had them come, and I had them in a room, and I taught them some martial arts. I taught them some basic punch, basic kick. And there these, now these children, you know, are 8, 9, 10 years old, so the moms are 30, 35. And so I taught a couple how to break a board. And then when the curtain opened, the Taekwondo demonstration was being done by the moms of some of the kids in the audience. Now, they were, the kids were shocked. Mom, I didn't know you did martial arts. I don't. You know, <laughs> the first lesson was 30 minutes ago or an hour ago. So they broke some boards. And so the point of it was it was so empowering for the children to actually see that something about in mom that just fascinated them and they were so proud. And this girl who's in the picture with me, you see her legs kind of turned off to the side. She had, you know, she was born with, uh, with a certain tumor that affects the hips. It's called Wilms tumor. And so she can't walk. So she wasn't able to do much during the demonstration except watch. Those little green things are her crutches. The little red thing is the cart that they cart them around in. And her mother was in the demonstration. And her mother was just like her, very small and petite, uh, but her mother was the one who broke you know, one of the boards with her foot, something called an ax kick. And this little girl was so, so amazed, and she was, but she was shy, and she didn't want to come up and say hello to me. So one of the child life specialists said, would you come over here as a young girl wants to meet you? I said, sure. So I sat down next to her, she told me her name, uh, and we took this picture, and who are we waving to? Her mom, right? And it really is a, a wonderful picture because what it shows is the innocence of this child, just like the innocence of you, when you come to meet a doctor, whether it's me or whoever it was, and how you put your trust in them. You see how she has no problem you know, sitting there right next to me. She trusts implicitly. Mom is right there. And it creates this concept of family. I show the students this because I want them to realize what medicine can be or what it cannot be. It can be this. You can have what's in this picture in medicine. You can also not have it. You can go home and bang the table and be, you know, I've had enough. I've been up 14 hours, blah, 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 blah. I hear this from the residents. I say, well, we need to talk about, you know, why you're here to begin with and where your heart needs to be. Because if we keep the doctors focused on what they need to be, like you heard Dr. Taplin, Dr. Keibel, Dr. Ritchie, these are, you know, great thought leaders, and they're still doing it into their 60s and 70s and so forth. Um, then, you know, it makes the world a better place and it makes this a better place. So thank you for your attention tonight and for your time. Um, I look forward to seeing you. Thank you.